The next talk you're gonna see is the ins and outs of building an AWS data perimeter by John Burgess. Uh, before we get started, I am uh, going to talk about one of our sponsors, Wiz. Uh, Wiz secures everything organizations build and run in the cloud. Wiz enables hundreds of organizations worldwide, including 20% of the Fortune 500, to rapidly identify and remove critical risk in cloud environments. Its customers include Salesforce, BMW, Slack, Priceline, Rubrik, Salesloft, Plaid, DocuSign, amongst others. So thank you to Wiz. Um, without any further ado, I'm going to hand it over to John. Thanks. Hello, I'm John Burgess. I'm a cloud security software developer at Stripe. Stripe's mission is to increase the GDP of the internet. We do payment processing and a bunch of other things for millions of businesses. Today I'm going to be talking about the ins and outs of building an AWS data perimeter. This topic is way too big for a 20 minute talk, but I will do my best at providing a comprehensive introduction. And now we'll look at our agenda. First, we're going to go through the theory. What exactly is an AWS data perimeter? What does it do, and why do we need it? And then the building blocks. The perimeter is composed of six different controls. I'm going to talk about three today, and leave the rest for you to read about on your own. Next is the implementation. How can you set up these controls without breaking things, or at least in a way that breaks as few things as possible? And then finally, I'll wrap it up and send you on your way with some of the resources I found helpful. Let's start with the theory. The perimeter is a set of guardrails to control access to the boundary of your AWS organization. We'll be updating all sorts of IAM policies so that access through the perimeter is denied by default, and so that granting access requires a high level of approval. The goal is to establish a zone of distrust outside of your organization. It's not that you should necessarily trust what's within your organization, but that you should be very skeptical of principles and resources outside of it. The intuition behind the value of the perimeter is that when things go wrong in the cloud, it's very often because some data was passed through this organizational boundary. I mentioned that there are six fundamental AWS perimeter controls. They correspond to six types of cross-organizational access. This diagram shows two of the most basic types of access. Your principles accessing somebody else's resources and somebody else's principles accessing your resources. Now, obviously, it's necessary to have some trust relationships. You need to be able to trust your vendors and your customers but these trust relationships should be denied by default, centrally managed, and require a high level of approval to enable. This shows another way that things can go wrong, credentials crossing organizational boundaries. Somebody else's credentials making requests from within your network, or even worse, your credentials being used outside of your organization. There's two other types of access, but we're going to skip them for today. This is my mental model for how da dangerous different types of access, uh, different types of requests are. The safest are requests within the same account. In the middle are requests that are cross-account but stay in my AWS organization. And the most dangerous are requests that, cross, that are cross-account and leave my AWS organization. I'd like to make it so that almost any developer can enable requests within the same account. Fewer can enable cross-account requests. And very few, maybe only the security team, have the ability to create cross-organization requests. But the problem is that IAM policy evaluation has only two buckets of requests. Requests within an account and requests across accounts. Requests within an account succeed if there's an allow in the principal or in the resource for most types of resources. Requests across accounts succeed if there's an allow in the principal and in the resource. But it doesn't matter if the other account is within your AWS organization or not. In either case, the trust relationship is created the same way. We should trust accounts outside of our organization less than accounts within it, but AWS does not make this the default. This is the goal of the AWS data perimeter, to draw a line between cross-account requests within our organization and cross-account requests outside of our organization. This requires us to add a set of controls that will block cross-organization requests by default. Next, we'll go through the building blocks of the AWS data perimeter. I'm going to go through three of the six basic perimeter controls one service control policy, one VPC endpoint policy, and one resource policy. First, we'll look at preventing credential exfiltration. Your IAM role credentials have left the building, they've been exfiltrated outside of your organization, and they're being used to make requests outside of your network. We have the opportunity to create a control to tie these credentials down to your network in order to block this. 
But how does this happen? What is the most common ways that IAM role credentials are stolen? We're running a web application with an SSRF vulnerability on an EC2 host that's using IMDSV1. In a case like this, we should patch our application, and we should migrate to IMDSV2. But that's much easier said than done. But the third thing, and what I'm going to talk about today, is that we can actually block our IAM credentials from being used outside of our network using an AWS data perimeter control. This is the most basic form of the SCP that blocks the roles from being used outside of the network. We're going to deny all actions on all resources if all four conditions are true. The first condition is going to help me target only my EC2 instance roles. The minimal level of granularity for SCPs is the entire account, and it's unlikely that you want all roles in your account to be tied to your network. So we use the principal ARN condition to specify the roles that we want to lock down. If your EC2 roles don't have names that can be matched with a glob pattern like this, you can instead target roles based on their tags. Condition number two, string not equals. This returns true if the request is made, made outside of our VPC. The source VPC condition key is only available if the request is made through a VPC endpoint. If it's not routed through a VPC endpoint, we'll rely on our next condition, not IP address. This condition returns true if the request was not made from one of our trusted IPs. The source IP condition key is only available if the request was not made through a VPC endpoint. It represents the IP of the last hop out of your environment. And the fourth condition uh, returns true if the action is not made by an AWS service. Adding this condition allows AWS services to still use the targeted roles. Now that we have seen the base version of the SCP, let's look at some of the problems we're going to run into and their solutions. The first problem is cross-region VPC endpoint traffic. If you peer your VPCs, and let your hosts make cross-region requests through endpoints and other VPCs, you're going to have to allow list all those VPCs. So instead of locking our credentials down to one specific VPC, we're locking them down to a set of VPCs. The second problem is that your hosts may be generating and passing out pre-signed URLs, and these will be locked. When the client executes the action embedded in the URL, it performs the action as the principal that signed the URL. So this request is made using your service principal but outside of your network. And so it would be blocked by the SCP. You have a choice about what to do here. Uh, the first option leverages the S3 auth type condition key to check if the action is an S3 request that is authenticated via a pre-signed URL. If it is, the condition returns false, and so the action is not blocked. The second option is to cut the offending roles out of the control entirely. If any role, because of pre-signed URLs or for whatever reason, is unintentionally running afoul of the SCP, we can always allist it, allow list it in this manner. And the third problem is permission-only actions. These are often blocked by the SCP. Permission-only actions are actions that don't directly correspond to an API operation. One that cloud security talks about a lot is pass role. Pass role, fortunately, is not affected by the SCP, but many other permission-only actions are. I've added the actions that we found uh, that break during testing to the appendix for your reference. The one that I put here as an example is used for connecting to an RDS database using IAM authentication. To exclude these actions, instead of targeting all actions, we'll allow list um, these using the not action keyword. OK, so this was all of the exceptions. And when we combine them with the base policy, we get this uh, beautiful monstrosity of an SCP. In human language, this says, deny almost all actions on all resources if it's a role that we want to lock down, and it's not a role that we want to exclude from the control, and if the request is not made from the expected network, either through a VPC endpoint of one of our trusted VPCs or via one of our trusted IPs. And finally, if it wasn't AWS using the role on our behalf. And now if we return to the diagram, our credentials are being used outside of the expected network. So the SCP we just built denies access if they're being used to make requests. And even better, when our credentials are used within our network, access is still allowed. We haven't broken all of our services. OK, so we finished control number one. That was the most complicated one. Next, preventing bring your own credential attacks. This is the opposite problem of credential exfiltration. Instead of an attacker pulling your credentials out of your network, they're using their own credentials within your network in order to exfiltrate data. In this picture, we don't own the principal or the resource, so we can't add policies there. 
and an SCP will not help us. But the request is being routed through a VPC endpoint, and so we can create a VPC endpoint policy to block the action. The default policy has no restrictions at all. VPC endpoint policies are similar to permission boundaries and that they don't ever grant permissions. This policy of allow star 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 just represents the upper bound for, uh, for what requests can perform. The solution here is pretty simple. We add a condition that requires the principal to belong to our organization. If it doesn't, the request is denied. This only affects requests routed through this specific endpoint. You'll have to apply this to every endpoint. And that's just one type of egress to lock down. Now, a couple of things to look out for. The first thing is that it's uncommon, but some vendor integrations require that their external principles work within your network and use your endpoint. If this is the case, then you'll have to make an exception for those principles or for those endpoints. The second thing is that not every type of VPC endpoint supports custom endpoint policies. For example, the CloudTrail endpoint does not support custom policies. For these endpoints, their policies cannot be changed for, from full access. And the third thing, and it's kind of a weird one, but specifically for the EC2 endpoint, if you add a custom policy, this may cause some failed API requests to not be logged to CloudTrail. And now we'll look at the third control, preventing external data access. That is, only identities I trust can access my resources. Here we have a resource that we want to be private. We expect, to be, we expect it to be shared only within the AWS organization. But somebody has added a trust relationship to an external principle. We want to make it as difficult as possible for the resource to be shared outside of your organization. In this case, we create a resource policy in order to achieve this. And it's going to look something like this. On the left is the original S3 bucket policy that trusts the specified account. And on the right, we've modified the policy by adding a new statement that explicitly denies requests from principals outside of our organization. And now the account will be blocked if it doesn't belong to our organization. If it does belong to our organization, then there's no impact on its requests. This example uses an S3 bucket policy, but you can add a similar statement to any resource policy. Um, and then the first thing, it's kind of obvious, but before applying this control, you need to understand which of your buckets are shared externally and avoid adding the statement to them. And the second thing is that sometimes you want to have AWS accessing your resources. In this case, in this case you want to make an exception for AWS principles using this condition key. Now we'll talk about the implementation, how to decide what controls to choose and how to deploy them safely. A great first question to ask for any project is, should I actually do this? To answer this, I'll tell you that you should not consider doing this until you've set up your basic SCPs first, ones that prevent accounts from leaving the organization and that stop CloudTrail from being disabled. These are listed in Scott Piper's AWS Security Maturity Roadmap. Once you've done those things, which AWS perimeter control should you implement first? It depends on your threat model. It's the one that would address risk in your environment. In terms of effort, I find SCPs easier than VPC endpoints uh, and resource policies. They're managed centrally, while the others, you have to attach them to all applicable resources. This is easier to do if you have all of your infrastructure defined as code and have commonly reused modules. And the next thing is deployment. Before starting to deploy a control, you should back test it on actions in CloudTrail to see what it would have blocked. Depending on your configuration, CloudTrail may be missing some data. It's common, for example, to not log data events. You should make alarms on access denied errors in your organization. This, this is, it's helpful to know if you've broken something or if somebody is running into your controls. And for resource policies, first stop the bleeding. Make sure new resources are created with your perimeter control statements. And then backfill existing resources. For the SCPs, rollouts can be terrifying because they have the ability to break everything everywhere all at once. So deploy them very slowly and very carefully. It is likely that you will find exceptions specific to your environment that you need to address. But the nice thing is that the IAM policy language is pretty flexible. So you can craft targeted SCPs and roll them out slowly as long as you have the imagination and patience. I'll show two approaches you can use for incremental SCP deployments. The first is tag-based. You give the relevant roles tags to indicate different deployment stages, and then stage by stage, you add them to the condition. And then when you're ready for the SCP to, tar to target all the relevant roles, you just remove the condition. Then the next method is based off the role names. I call these alphabet deployments. This method is useful when you have a bag of roles and you don't really care about the deployment order. 
and when you're too lazy to create new tags for your roles. Here, we're only targeting the EC2 host roles that start with the letter A, and now the ones that start with the letters A through C, and so on and so forth. Once you've covered the entire alphabet and your SCP is fully deployed, you can remove the condition. And now it will match all the EC2 host roles regardless of their prefix. This method is crude and kind of ridiculous, but it works. That's everything that I had for you. We went over what the AWS perimeter is, three of its controls, and how to set those controls up safely. All I have left to say is that AWS data perimeter is good, cross-organizational access is bad, unless it's explicitly approved by the security team. No, but really, Stripe has found that these controls are unreasonably effective for the amount of effort they take to set up, so we thought that we'd share what we learned along the journey of deploying them. Thank you. Uh, Sorry. Anyone have questions from the audience? All right. Uh, I think I missed it, but uh, why were you excluding the uh, permission-only actions from the original first policy again? If you don't do that, um, then they will all be blocked. And so if you have roles that are used that um, require those actions, then they need to be allowed listed. Okay, but wouldn't that be the same as any other like action? Yeah, it's just that it's very common for permission-only actions to be blocked by this, but other actions are not. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that Stripe found these to be um, really valuable for the amount of effort involved. Uh, can you share anything about how you measured the effectiveness of these and, and sort of differences you saw before and after putting them in place? Yeah, well, so it, it, it depends on, um, we thought of specific scenarios that we were afraid of happening and different ways that we could block that from happening. Um, and then we chose the one that sort of required the least amount of effort in order to uh, block the potential risk. So uh, cross-organizational, perimet perimeters for cross-organizational cross access makes sense. Uh, what about multi-tenant accounts where your perimeters where you might want to set up parameters where the threats are different, right? So you might want to separate data that is in, in different islands and control access by setting up parameters. Have you thought about that use case at all? Are you saying, are you talking about like parameters within a single account? Yes, that's right. Yeah, I... Are, are you in your own account where multiple accounts or there is like maybe a shared S3 bucket, right, yeah. which has a different threat profile. So there's a group of accounts where you might want to create a parameter because the threats there are very different compared to the low trust environments where this S3 bucket does not have access at all. Right? Yeah, this is a really great natural extension for these controls. So the, the ones that I've shown are applied to the organization, but you can apply similar controls to a set of an accounts, to an OU, um, or to a specific account that you want to uh, reduce access to. Okay. Hi, uh, thanks for the information. Uh, for the majority of us that do use SCPs, uh, we've all uh, come to the limit of the size that they can be. So have you come up with a, a framework to decide what makes it in, what doesn't? So we've been able to shove everything that we want into our SCPs. Something that we found is helpful is even if you have a single account, you can put it in its own OU, and then you can apply five extra SCPs to it. And then I forget the maximum limit of how many OUs you can have in, in terms of like the depth of the tree, but using something like that, you could probably apply like 25 to 30 SCPs to a single account. So you just have to like mess with your organizational structure in order to enable it. Any other questions? Looks like we're empty on Slack too. So, All right. John will be around if you guys have more questions. Thank you. See you in a few minutes.